Dr. Gretchen LaSalle is a board-certified family physician. She completed her medical school training at the Tulane University School of Medicine and her residency at the Oregon Health and Science University. She has practiced at MultiCare Rockwood Clinic in Spokane, Washington for the last 13 years and serves as a clinical associate professor for the WSU Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine. Vaccine advocacy came as a natural extension of her passion for preventative care. She's an active writer and public speaker on the topic, and in October 2019, published a book with Walters Kluwer Press titled Let's Talk Vaccines, A Clinician's Guide to Addressing Vaccine Hesitancy and Saving Lives. In a growing climate of vaccine hesitancy, her primary mission is to keep patients from falling victim to vaccine misinformation and to decrease the frustrations while increasing the successes that clinicians have in getting patients vaccinated. We discuss how to have the most fruitful discussion with the vaccine hesitant. She has a system for addressing these patients and parents, and no surprise, it starts with listening. The hesitation comes with all sorts of concern, from stories they've heard to potential side effects to simply indecision, and she has a well-thought-out discussion for all of these. We get into the cognitive biases that may be at play and end on her experiences on social media with the vaccine-averse, who are the vocal majority, but really the minority, versus someone who is simply hesitant. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Gretchen LaSalle, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. So tell us your origin story with regard to the book. Why did you, did you decide to write it? Well, so it all started sort of several years ago, maybe more. I've always been sort of prevention focused. And so I'm constantly talking to my patients about mammograms and colonoscopies and, and vaccines, of course. And I live in the inland Northwest, Spokane, Washington. And and I was encountering a fair number of my patients who were really hesitant about vaccines or just kind of declining vaccines and bringing these concerns to me that I didn't really know how to answer. It, it kind of all came to a head in, a, in flu season where many of us sort of are talking about this a lot and in primary care especially. And, and I, I was just continuing to feel like I was beating my head against a wall trying to convince people to get this vaccine, which we know to be life-saving. And yet I couldn't talk people out of some of the, the misconceptions that they had. And, and that didn't sit well with me. <laughs> I, I obviously, in primary care, we can't know everything, but I really felt like my inability to, to speak to their concerns was not only frustrating to me, but was, you know, leaving them at risk and unvaccinated. And so I kind of set out to educate myself. You know, we get a lot of teaching in medical school in the basics of, of vaccine science immunology, uh, pathophysiology, infectious disease, public health, et cetera. But we really, I didn't feel prepared coming out of medical school or residency to address, you know, questions about, oh, aluminum and, and um, you know, fetal cells used in vaccines and all these things that were kind of coming my way. So I set out to educate myself about those topics and tried to remain open-minded. I mean, you know, I wanted to, if there was something of concern, I wanted to find it and recognize it. And and, and nothing that I found gave me any level of worry about vaccines and only reinforced what I was telling my patients, which is that they're, you know, overwhelmingly safe and effective and one of the best things we can do to preserve our health. And along the way, I also recognized how much my partners were struggling with these conversations, how much wonderful information is out there, but it takes hours and hours and hours, hundreds of hours a research to find all these questions. And I'm a part-time physician. I work half-time. And so I had had this time and this passion to find these answers. But many in primary care do not have the time to do their own independent research about all these things. And so while there's a lot of great information out there, it wasn't all in one place that was really easily accessible to the practicing clinician, primary care provider. And so I wanted to create this resource that spoke to all sorts of aspects of addressing vaccine hesitancy, including, you know, the sort of point counterpoint to the claims that we were hearing. And, and that's how I came up with the book. What's one of the more audacious claims that is being made right now that you were, that you're, that you're able to rebut? <laughs> oh my like, God. So give me something that's like, 
you know, I try to make the podcast entertaining. So give me something that's just so out there that, that, <laughs> so that there. but it's, but it's still something that clinicians need to be aware of and need to be able to rebut. Well, I don't know that this one is so out there. I mean, I'm sure people have heard. If I had thought, been able to think about this ahead, I might have given you something juicy. Sorry, that but... wasn't in one of my pre, uh, pre questions. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. But one that's you know just sort of totally untrue, and 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 is a is something I talk about frequently, and is a, is a probably a common refrain for a lot of primary care family medicine and, and pediatricians is the the claim that the HPV vaccine will um, cause risky sexual behavior. Parents are really concerned that if they give their 11-year-old, some parents, that if they give their 11 or 12-year-old a vaccine, it's going to suddenly give them permission to go out and have sex and 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 participate in risky behaviors, which is completely untrue. Right. It's, so like, I, it's like teaching abstinence in high school instead of instead of sex education. Right. right. It, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't this, by teaching <laughs> safe sex, it doesn't encourage sex. Right. It's the more sex. Exactly. And there's this great graphic that was in um there was a study out of British Columbia where they looked at 300,000 girls. They have a they have a school-based HPV program. So they looked at these girls before the program was instituted and after the program was instituted and then looked at all these markers of risky behavior, things like age of first sexual activity, pregnancy rates, use of birth control, uh, STDs, et cetera. And for almost every marker, the girls that had the HPV vaccine, their risky behavior improved. <laughs> so they were less risky than the girls who had not had the HPV vaccine. And undoubtedly, there's there's education to that, right? It's part of a school-based program. So they were probably getting some sex education to go along with that. But we do that in clinic one-on-one too. So, you know, there's no truth to that to that myth that, that this vaccine is going to cause our kids to start having sex any earlier or with a greater number of partners, et cetera. Well, you mentioned the, the HPV vaccine, and I think this certainly bears mentioning because you had a a blog post about asking specialists to please start talking about vaccines with their patients. And this, this actually being an ENT, this is something that I discuss with my patients and I, what I do, and maybe, maybe I should having that bit of information is going to help me that I tell them the earlier, the better, because then you might do it early enough that you can avoid having the conversation that you may not be prepared. It doesn't force the conversation that you weren't yet prepared to have with your kid. If they, if they get it early on, I think it's like nine in girls and 10 in boys. I think it might it's be nine. Yeah. Nine yeah. all around or yeah. nine all around. You yeah. might be able to just say, Oh, you're going to get another vaccine. And, and, and then we're going to go to the toy store or then we're going to get you a video <laughs> game or something like that. And you can just like run distraction and you, then table the conversation until you're right. ready to have it. And it's overwhelmingly not the kids who are kind of putting up a fuss. It's the parents. And I think it is, I think you're right. I think it's much easier to kind of, the focus we want to put on it is this, that this is a cancer prevention vaccine. So it's much easier to focus on cancer prevention when parents are not at all even thinking about their kids as sexual beings. (laughs) So there's a move in primary care now, instead of waiting to the traditional 11 to 12 year old visit, to start at nine, because it may be easier for us to really be able to focus on cancer prevention instead of yes, this is a sexually transmitted infection, and then we go down that rabbit hole. So when you do address vaccine-hesitant parents, do you have a a system that you use? Is it, (laughs) and it's not going to be one size fits all, but have you found that, I read on one of your posts, listen, acknowledge, and clarify. And I really liked how (laughs) systematic that was. Is that, is that what you use? Pretty much. I mean, you know, the the, the first thing that that really helps is that we go in just assuming that they're going to take the recommendations that we're offering. It's called the the presumptive approach. So we go in presuming that, you know, I say today we're due for tetanus, HPV cancer vaccine, and meningitis vaccine. We'll get those before you go. So I'm assuming they're going to say yes. I'm not giving them the option. Of course, they always have the option. Nobody's shooting darts at the kids as they're running out the door, but um, (laughs) we're tackling them to the ground. We're not doing that. Um, But if we go in making that assumption, it gives the parents um, and the patients that confidence that, that, that we are confident, that we have no qualms about what we're offering. This is what's the best thing for, for the kids. And that doesn't mean we're not bullying anybody. If you're still paying attention to um, body language and facial cues and that sort of thing, you're going to detect if someone's still hesitant. And then you can back it up and say, and this is the next part, the ask. This is the most important part, I think. <laughs> then we need to ask. What is it that worries you about this? Or tell me, I think that's a really powerful um, 
statement or question is, tell me what's worrying you about these vaccines. What have you heard? And it gives families or parents the ability to open up without, it's inviting them into a conversation. We're not talking down to them. We're not bullying them or pressuring them. We're just inviting, inviting them into a conversation. And hopefully that sets them at ease. And then we can really talk about their particular concerns because everybody's got different concerns. And if we assume that they have a particular concern, we're going to miss, miss the mark. And then we go into kind of addressing e- each of those individually and acknowledging. I think it's important to acknowledge that it's hard being a parent these days. There's so much more information out there that's available to us through the internet and social media that you know our, our parents didn't have. And it's hard to make sense of what is accurate and what's not, what's reliable and what's not. And so I think if we can acknowledge that to patients, they appreciate it or to parents. And if we recognize that, it's a lot easier for us to empathize with patients than to just get frustrated that they're saying, no, thank you. The other thing I I try to do, and I may not be going in order of exactly how I do this, but after I ask what their worries are, what their concerns are, I always ask permission to talk to them. You know, I'll ask, what are your concerns about the HPV vaccine? Oh, I've heard that it can make kids sexually active earlier. Well, can I, can I tell you uh, what I know about that? And, and again, it gives the parents some power so that they're not feeling powerless in the, in the conversation because they probably already feel a little bit at a disadvantage. Um, And maybe a little concern that we might judge them for their concerns and that sort of thing. But if we give them some power in the conversation, I think that helps. And I've I've only ever once in my whole career had someone say, no, (laughs) you cannot talk to me. (laughs) So I think it just opens, it opens it up for a dialogue so that we can address their issues and then we can clarify and and educate. Let's say it isn't a specific concern. This Mm -hmm. is kind of getting to my case presentation that I was going to say later, but uh, we'll just get to that now. Let's say (laughs) they don't, they're they're not able to articulate the specific concern. They just say, I just want to do more research. I just, Mm -hmm. there's so much out there. Like you said, you can acknowledge their hesitancy because there's so much out there. It's so overwhelming, but they're not prepared to make a decision right now. They want to do more research. And you know what that means. A lot of times they just, you know, because it's it's just endless. The information is endless. It's the paradox okay. of choice, right? We don't have one, two salad dressings to choose from. We've got 50 salad dressings to choose from. And you can stand in the salad dressing aisle in the supermarket forever and still not make a decision. So it's the paradox right. of choice. What do you do in that situation? First, I, I feel pretty comfortable with having parents do that, it, especially if they hadn't really been thinking about it before and I'm just sort of springing it on them. I can understand that it, it takes some some thinking and sometimes it's actually more or less rather the person I'm talking to thinking, but they have to go home and discuss it with the spouse. That's That's what I come across more often. But I think it's really important to keep the communication open and say, okay, well, first, let me give you some resources because you don't want them just going out there and, you know, hopping on Google and, and getting into kind of places that aren't reputable for their, for their information. So you want to be able to give them some, some resources that you trust and some information that you trust. While you're on that topic, what are the resources that you recommend to patients? Oh, gosh, I have a ton. Um, So, of course, the CDC is an excellent resource. Now, if you have someone who's a little more true anti-vaxxer, which most of the folks we're talking to in clinic are not, but and who has sort of paranoia about the government and the CDC and big pharma and all that stuff, CDC is not going to be helpful for them. And I would actually argue that spending too much time trying to convince people who are staunch, staunch anti-vaxxers to change is is a waste of our time. And it's just going to be frustrating for us and for them. But if they're open to hearing, then I recommend the CDC, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the Vaccine Education Center that Paul Offit runs, Dr. Offit, um, is excellent. You know, it kind of depends on the person I and, w- and what we're talking about, uh, what kind of vaccines we're talking about. I think for families who are or parents or patients who are needing to hear from non-medical people, then Voices for Vaccines is a great uh, site. It's it's a, a layperson run website, and it's really it gives stories of people. And this is where I got the three people for my book that I interviewed. Who a lot of stories of people who have been anti-vaccine and then changed their minds, and how they got there, and what the thinking process was that got them there, or the events in their lives that got them there. So if people really, re- if stories really resonate, you think with folks, then that's a good site. Families Fighting Flu is another one uh, similar, uh, specific to the flu. And then there's a, if you have your sort of more like my neck of the woods folks, who I love, by the way, but my 
crunchy granola folks who are more sort of natural minded and want to, you know, talk to their naturopath. And we've got a lot of that out here. There's actually a group called uh, NDs, naturopathic doctors, NDs for vaccine. And so I refer folks to that site as well. These are all online sites because not all naturopaths are anti-vaccine, it turns out. So (laughs) yeah, I think um, it's interesting because one of the things that they ascribe to is homeopathy, right? And the idea behind, uh, at at its most basic level, the idea of homeopathy is you're introducing a very small particle to the body so that it learns how to react to it. Which is exactly Which what is what vaccine. affects exactly. Come on. It's completely in line with what you believe. But, this is not. Yeah. Which but I think they, they probably get mired in the conspiracies more than anything. Yeah. Homeopathy is a little bunk, but <laughs> but there's there are groups of, and I've tried to get to the bottom of this talking to some of my naturopathic colleagues, but you know, there's different lines of thinking in naturopathy. And so there are some folks who are very much evidence-based medicine focused but that's probably less of what we think of when we think of as a natural uh, when we think of naturopaths but they are out there and th- and this is a great resource for folks who kind of have that sort of a, a leaning and what was that site again with the with the stories because i think just the way that the human brain works right we're not designed to understand statistics right if right. you say your likelihood of uh, encountering this is 1 in 100,000 and by taking the, the the human brain can comprehend i think one or two and then mm-hmm. after that, it's just a bunch. And yeah. so, you know, com- but but you hear a story, you know, and yeah. we, the way we evolved, someone's uh, someone said, there's food over there or look out, right? You're going to believe them and respond. So stories yeah. just, they're stickier. They work better. Yeah. So what, we have, what was that we, site again? Yeah, it's called Voices for Vaccines. Voices for Vaccines. Great. We'll yeah. have I'll actually all of those listed in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we have a much more rapid response, emotional response to information then we do a sort of a cognitive response. And you're right, people people will emotionally respond to uh, stories and it, it is more meaningful for them sometimes than, than the data. Even though if we don't have the data at our fingertips, then we come off looking like we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> so we, we have to have uh, that data available um, and have some working knowledge of that. But if we can really, if we can tell stories I think it's it, it means more to patients. Do you find that useful? Do you find anecdotes to be useful when you're talking to people who are vaccine hesitant? Or does it I come do. off as like fear mongering? Well, I don't know. I haven't really talked to someone after the fact to find out how they interpreted it. Step into this room and we're going to have someone talk to you about your experience and find out. How, yeah, no, we don't yeah. really have those in, in medicine. I, know. I mean, I definitely... I try to get people to, I mean, gosh, there's this whole psychology of the anti-vaccine movement and fallacy and bias, but I try to get people to, I give stories. There was a, um, I'm a member of this group called Physician Moms Group PMG on Facebook, which I don't know if you've heard of, but it's a 70,000 plus Dr. Yes. Mom's and mom if Facebook. anyone wants to share this episode on that site, please go uh, ahead. That would be amazing. <laughs> but there was a mom there, uh, in the group who lost her son to the flu, her three or four year old. And oh God. she she's a physician and she had every intention of going and taking him. And as life does, you know, it got busy and, and she ended up they were going to go, I think it was around Christmas time, ended up being able to go. And by then he got the flu and he passed away, which is so super sad. And I, and I, tr- so I try to use stories like that and, and say, and try to have families anticipate the regret that they would feel. Can you imagine if you, if just chose not to decide, because sometimes it's easier to default to not make it, not making a decision than to make a decision. Or if you actively decided not to vaccinate and, and something happened to your child that you could have prevented I mean, I, I wouldn't want anybody to, to have to go through that. And, and I don't want you to have to go through that. And I love your child. And I, and I <laughs> you know, I try to kind of do all of that stuff to, to let them know that I don't, I don't ever want them to have to experience that. So I will, I will use stories. You and know. I love that phrase. You, you, you had written that on one of your blog posts. Not making a decision is making a decision not to act. I love yeah. that. I love that. Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't want to weaponize that to my patients, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, informing them that they're, you know, to be hesitant indefinitely is you're, you're making a decision or the decision is being made for you. Yeah. And, and, you know, statistically, not that people love statistics, but we're much more likely to have a, a bad outcome from an illness than we are from a vaccine, way more likely. So, but it's hard. People, you're right. People just tune out to, to statistics. Although I do find some 
you know, particularly with the flu, I, I, I had a different blog post where I talked about how numbers, how we think about numbers matters. And so I talked about, you know, the flu is kind of my favorite example where two years ago, the 2017-18 flu season, 80,000 people died in the U.S. just in, in that one year, which is much more than our normal. Our average is sort of 12 to 56,000, you know, 36 on the average year deaths in the U.S., from the flu each year, which is a lot. But we had 80,000 people die that year. And, and so I went through kind of all the numbers. What does that break down to? That's like for however many million people we had in the country that year, that was like one in 484,000 people. And that's an entire professional football stadium, people gone in one year. That's, I can't remember the numbers now, but let's say 250 crashes of a 747 jetliner. I mean, that would that would get our attention, right? We, mm-hmm. we wouldn't think, oh, 250 crashes of a jetliner. That's no big deal. I mean, the, air, the airline industry would be up in arms. It, it'd be huge. But for some reason, we just don't think about the flu as a big deal. And so I try to put it in numbers that make sense to people or are more impactful, more emotional sort of numbers. <laughs> and, and, and I find that that helps sometimes. More people died of the flu after World War One than died in World War I. I'm a, yes. I like that statistic. Yeah. It's crazy. And even in a combination of some of the world wars, <laughs> more in one year. And I, I mean, I think it's huge. The, 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 the life expectancy reduced 12 years in one year <laughs> because of the flu. Wow. It was, it was crazy in 1918. So when, they, when patients ask, what are the side effects? So a more, again, a more general question. What are the mm-hmm. side effects? Something like that. Or so rather I, that specific question. How, how do you answer uh, that? Well, first, I think it's super important that we don't minimize side effects because if we say, oh, everything's going to be fine, there's not, you know, there's nothing that can happen, nothing can go wrong, and something does, then people don't believe we have their best interest at heart. They think we're trying to pull something over on them. Um, I think we have to be honest about the potential adverse effects of, of these in medical interventions. And so, but I talk about sort of how often these things happen. And, and it's, of course, of course, all different depending on which vaccine we're talking about. But for the flu, I say, you know, it's pretty common that people will we definitely will be sore, your arm will be sore, but you might feel achy, you might feel like something viral is coming on, you could even have a low-grade fever, but that's normal. That's your, your immune system kicking into gear. That's actually, even though it's not super comfortable, it's actually a good sign. It's a sign that your immune system is working. And I think part of the reason people think mistakenly that the flu shot can make them sick is because we haven't done a good job of explaining what they can expect. And if we tell them about it, then it's not scary. And they don't think they're getting sick. They're like, oh yeah, the doctor warned me about this. So I know it'll go away in a day or two and it's not a big deal. You know, for it's a big issue right now with the shingles vaccine, the new, the new shingles vaccine, because about one in six people who get that new shingles vaccine, it's been out on the market for the last couple of years, one in six people will have a pretty big reaction. They'll get, they'll get a big red swollen arm. They'll feel feverish and achy and like they have the flu for two or three days. They're in bed for two or three days. Some people have some nausea and vomiting and and we really need to tell them that that could occur or else they probably wouldn't get the second dose. <laughs> and yeah, I just you I, need to plan I, accordingly if you're not yeah, going to be able say, to If go this to work. happens to you, it's not an allergic reaction. It's not dangerous, but it is very uncomfortable and mostly I tell people this for planning purposes. Like if you have a big trip you've been planning for 2 years, you might not want to do it right before you go. I think it's super important for us to be upfront about the potential common adverse events. And then if people get into like the really uncommon things, we, we deal with those, but. Oh, so you don't, you don't list those, the ones that are exceedingly no. rare. You're not going to just continue to. Right. I don't want to rattle them. off side effects indefinitely. <laughs> Right. It's like when people you know, know, read nausea, the, the medication yeah. inserts for the prescriptions we give them. And they're yeah. like, I'm not taking that. It says I could die. So, yeah. you know, I tell them about the common stuff the, uh, and, and then anything else, if they have questions I talk about, it. I'm not hiding it. You know, I'm happy to talk about anything that they want to talk about. But, and, and, you know, like for the MMR vaccine, if we're giving it in adults, pretty, you know, I think it's something like 20 to 25% of women will get a temporary arthritis. They'll get pain in their joints. And, and so, you know, I try to warrant with the rubella, uh, with the rubella portion. So I try to warn them about that and, and just give them some reality to expect. And I think it makes people a lot less afraid if they, if they know what, what to expect. Is there ever a role for discussing cognitive biases. So if they say, well, there's risk involved in taking the vaccine, you'll respond with, well, there's risk involved in going down the stairs. So, you know, oh, yeah. you can't live your life like that. That's the nirvana bias, right? I think that's what yeah. so is 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 that do you ever do you, is that ever in your armamentarium? 
Yeah, absolutely. We talk about that omission bias is one of the things we were just talking about before where, you know, it seems safer to to not do something than to do something. And so the not doing something is not deciding to vaccinate versus the decision to vaccinate, which seems more of a commission. That's the the omitting seems safer than the committing. But I try to turn that around on people and say the standard and the best thing is to vaccinate. So that is the the omission would be defaulting to the standard recommendation and the commission would be, I don't use those words, but um, you know, the commission would be choosing not to vaccinate. And, and that's the more risky part. Um, and we talk about, you know, what are the likelihoods of these things happening? Um, and try, I try to draw attention to the fact that, you know, we worry about side effects, but in reality, these are so much more rare than the, the negative effects of the illness itself. I also talk about confirmation bias. And again, I don't necessarily call it confirmation bias when I'm talking about it, but that's the, um, or I'm sorry, this is this is actually a fallacy. This is not confirmation bias. This is uh, something called post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means after this, therefore, because of this, if you have something that happens in time in relation to another event, so vaccines, autism, right? This is what happens in that whole association. It makes sense in our minds to draw a correlation between those things, even if there was no no correlation. And we know that vaccines do not cause autism. But when autism is, is finally recognized, although we're starting to recognize it earlier and earlier, but it is about the time that kids are getting a larger series of shots. And so it makes sense that parents would would make that leap to assume that it was related. It's really hard to think that something so impactful as, a, as an autism diagnosis could not have a reason behind it. I think it's it's much more comfortable for people to to settle on a, a, an, an erroneous reason than to have no reason at all. And so, but we talk about we talk about that, you know, just because I ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich before I got into a car accident today does not mean the peanut butter and jelly sandwich caused my car accident. And so and then we get into sort of the research and the data about autism and how many hundreds of thousands of kids have been studied and, and no, no link shown between vaccines and autism. Post hoc ergo proctor hoc. I think I learned what that was from a West Wing episode a long time ago. Just because one came first doesn't mean it caused it. Yeah, that's an excellent one. Yeah. How do you address concerns about spacing out vaccinations? Is that something that you will allow your patient parents to do for their kids, or you you go strictly by the guidelines? Or if if they are even inquiring about that, how do you answer? Um, yeah, I so I mean I I will allow that if that's the only way I'm going to get kids vaccinated. So if they're like I'm not going to do it unless we can do it one at a time and I can't convince them otherwise then I'll do it because some vaccines are better than no vaccines. But I I very much try to talk parents out of that. And I actually haven't had people request that as much lately and the whole um Dr. Sears book which is what put forth that spaced out series has kind of, you know, it's less popular than it used to be, but we talk about why they want to, is it the, is it the number of pokes? They're worried that their kid's going to hurt because their kids, you know, at six months, nine months have no memory of these pokes. They, they'll be crying for two seconds and then the next minute they're laughing again. So, you know, we talk about that. If they have concerns, actually just, so I'm doing a post every day about a vaccine fact on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Yes, I've been following those on the SoMeDocs website. Right. So today, I think it was today, we talked about how, you know, some people say, oh, it's all, you know, all the aluminum in there. I'm worried about it. So I try to get them off of that train and, you know, talk about how aluminum, there are no harmful levels of aluminum. But if they are still convinced that, you know, they don't want to do these vaccines altogether because of the cumulative aluminum exposure, I will go through what I wrote today on my post, which is that if you break up the vaccines, and I was using the DTaP and Hib, the amount of aluminum per dose in those, if you separate them out, is even more than if you have them in the DTaP IPV Hib combo. So doing more vaccines together in one poke is less aluminum exposure than if you space them out. And, the, gotcha. and really, I mean, the main, <laughs> the main worry is that you know, they're going to be left uh, in completely vaccinated. And so that puts them at risk. It puts the community at risk. And, and you know, having three young boys, and I know as a parent how crazy life gets. And, you know, it's not uncommon that parents forget to come back. And so, and then we, we don't have them for another year till they come back for their, their visit. And so it not only increases the total number of um, pokes that they have to have and the number of visits that they have to have, 
and the chance that their child will start to hate coming to the doctor because they have to come all the time and get poked and hurt, but it puts them at risk for illness. If they get exposed, they don't have full immunity. So it puts them at risk of illness and of spreading illness to others. Do you ever get concerned that you're digging your heels in too far? You mentioned at the beginning, you know, you're you're able to read their nonverbal communication, their facial expression, their body posture to, to try and figure out kind of where they are, right? Yeah. But yeah. I mean, does it ever get, how, how do you keep yourself in that place, right? Where you're not <laughs> being too aggressive? Yeah, I think it's easier to get there when you're just meeting somebody for the first time. It's really hard to make change the first time you meet someone. But as you get to know them and they get to know you and they trust you, it gets easier. I don't think I've lost any patience <laughs> because I've I've kind of spurred them on and encouraged them to talk. And even if they don't want to talk about it, I'm like, there's got to be some reason. Let me know what's going on. What, what, what are your concerns? Um, I don't think I've lost anyone, but I think you do. You just have to be mindful of, of the, those body cues and facial expressions. And, and I put it off for another day and I'll say, okay, well, thanks for, you know, I try to appreciate the time that they did give me and I, and I'll thank them for listening and let them know I'm not doing this to be annoying. I'm not trying to bully them. I just, I want them to make a decision, which is really a hugely important decision for their health or their child's health based on good information. So, and there's so much that's out there that is not always accurate, but I want to make sure we address any of that and, and clear, clear things up so that they can make a really well-informed decision. And then, you know, I try again another day. That's, I think that's a really important approach is to not give up, (laughs) to not, you know, take no for an answer in the moment, but don't take it forever. Things will change people's minds. Events uh, will happen in their lives, or they may ultimately just come to hear you and have a chance to read and think about things. And, And the next time or the third time or the fourth time that you're talking about it, it will, it will make a difference. And that actually happens fairly frequently. I'll, I'll get people to come around over time. And I try to, when I'm teaching and lecturing and stuff, I try to use those examples because it can be really easy to feel hopeless, <laughs> to kind of feel defeated as a as a, a, a physician or a clinician who's trying to promote vaccines when you're getting turned down. But if you continue at it in a very respectful way and don't give up, you'll often make headway. It's like dating. It's like you keep trying and it's, it's just not working out. I'll tell you the story <laughs> I have from of one of my patients. She's one of my favorite ladies and she's probably in her, she's actually in my book. She let me use her story in the book. She's probably in her sixties and she was someone who was very natural. You know, I I eat healthy, I exercise, I, there's none of that. And this was for everything, not just vaccines for mammograms and colonoscopies. I don't have cancer in my family. You know, I'm healthy. I feel good. No, I don't want my X, Y, and Z. And then she, so everything pretty much she declined uh, that was preventative. And so she had a couple summers ago, she developed shingles and it just really devastated her. I mean, it lasted for months. She was in pain for months and she felt terrible. And, and so the next time she came in for her wellness visit, she had done a complete 180 and she's like, doc, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> I want all the stuff. Give me my colonoscopy. Everything my all at once. Yeah. <laughs> I want my flu give shot. The, I want my pneumonia vaccine. vaccine. While I'm getting my colonoscopy. Right. <laughs> so that is probably a little unusual. People aren't usually that big of a turnaround, but it, but it is not uncommon that they will say, I got so sick last year and I thought I was going to die and I'm never doing that again. Give me that flu shot this year. I mean, things will happen. It definitely is easier when I'm dealing with adults, when I'm dealing with kids where parents are declining for the kids. It's harder for me. Um, to well, there's not more urgency there. Yeah, to not at least internally feel some resentment (laughs) towards them. I don't express that, but, you know, that's a much harder situation. You know, then again, I I don't, I don't know how you feel or if you've talked to other folks about how they handle families that don't vaccinate, but I don't dismiss those families or discharge those families from my practice because I feel like if I do, then uh, they're just going to go find someone else who, who supports their worries. They're not going to have a chance to, to receive the education that I can give them. And then the kids, I think, if we continue to offer and continue to express how important the vaccines are, the kids will grow up hearing that message. And I've had, I've had cases where the kids that I've cared for from young childhood up through adolescence, by the time they get to adolescence, are saying, I want to get vaccinated. <laughs> so we do have the ability to make that difference. It just sometimes is, it's the long game. It's, it's a marathon. It, yeah. Yeah. It's not, not a sprint. sprint. Yeah, yeah. And I think my perspective as a specialist is, is a little different because I might only have them for one or two visits and then right. 
they're not my patients anymore. So I feel like when I have those HPV conversations, it's if they haven't come out of it saying, oh yeah, we're going to do that. We'll get right on that. feel like I have failed them because I don't have that relationship where I get to see them again and again and yeah. again. And really, I don't think that's really my role, like to just, you yeah. know bring well, it up over and over and over for something that I'm not seeing them for. But, right. but I think- I hope, I hope that you'll feel not feel too much that way and that you'll know that we as in primary care appreciate that so much because it really plants a seed. I mean, it's the same way, like if our MAs, when they're rooming somebody, they're saying, okay, you're due for your flu shot and your tennis shot and this, that, and the other thing. Even if they decline it to the MA, it's planted a seed. Yeah. And then the second person who comes in or the third person who comes in and says the same thing, I often will have patients decline a shot for my MA, but then I'll be able to talk them into it. And I think that's partly because she greased the wheels a little bit. So uh, we very much appreciate your efforts. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. So you're, as we talked about earlier, very active on social media. Yeah. And this is where we get into the vaccine averse parents. You already mentioned, right? Like you're going to feel it if you're really, if they're averse, not hesitant. Really, this is <laughs> this conversation is, is about how to address the vaccine hesitant, which is the line share of the patient. If they're vaccine averse, it's going to be, you're going to be hitting your head against the wall, but even still planting the seed makes sense. But on social media, I don't think we really get that much noise from vaccine hesitant patients. They're right. more the lurkers. Right. They're lurking in the shadows. So let's talk <laughs> about how, you, in the shadow, let's talk about how you handle social media. Uh, if you post something on a public sphere about vaccines and the comment section explodes in anger and vitriol and misinformation. How do you handle that? Well, so first off, I don't have anything other than Twitter and um, Instagram that could go that way. Like my Facebook, I don't have a Facebook account for my personal brand or whatever you want to call it. I just have my personal Facebook account. But my website that I have, uh, the comments have to be approved by me first. <laughs> so um, so that's very selected. Although honestly, I haven't had anything that's been too hateful. Amazing. But, uh, yeah. But how do I handle it if someone's kind of coming at me? I, I try to be, so I think just like in clinic, you know, if you were standing in, for someone who was standing in front of you in clinic and you were talking to them, if we are rolling our eyes and huffing and puffing and crossing our arms and criticizing and finger wagging, it does not help to change that person's point of view. <laughs> so I, I try to approach the online conversation the same way where I, you know, even though sometimes internally I want to curse, I do not allow myself to self <laughs> into that level. I try to remain professional and respectful and because really who I'm aiming at is not the person that I'm talking to. It's everybody else who's watching the conversation. So I try to remember that those people that are, that are the on the fence folks like I said, the anti-vaxxers, the true staunch anti-vaxxers, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't have a hope to change their minds. But it's everybody else that's watching the conversation. So I want to allow them to devolve into bad behavior, and I want to take the high road and offer. I try to offer up, you know, factual information and resources, and um, try to empathize, like I said, with how hard it is to make these decisions and to find accurate information and know what to believe. But yeah, so I, I just try to keep calm and 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 give good information and and not get into back and forths because it's not a debate. It's a discussion. I'll, I'll discuss, but it's not a debate. And if, if they're becoming angry and nasty and I, I will then block them because I, I don't think that is helpful for anybody to see. Yeah, I, I had an interview with Sarah Mojarad, who teaches medical students about how to handle themselves on social media. And one thing that came away from that was everything you put online should be something that you would be okay with your first grade teacher reading. So right. I think in, in that, or or in this situation, your kids, <laughs> yeah, yeah. your kids, like if you were getting in an argument with someone online or discussion or, or in person or online, you know, imagine your kids are there watching you. How do you want to model yourself for them? I think that's a good way to exactly. you know, read your post, read it again, and then before you hit the send button, the Absolutely. Of them in the background. And you see, you can see people in the medical community give in to that baser instinct, I will call it, <laughs> to name call or sort of other negative speak, but it, and it, it just doesn't reflect well on us. So we, I don't think we, we can do that to place a Star Wars reference, you're giving into the dark side when you do that. Right. 
Don't give in to the dark side. <laughs> exactly. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention about how to address vaccine hesitant patients and parents of patients you think we didn't get to today? Oh, gosh. It was pretty comprehensive. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think kind of just summing up, make a strong recommendation, go in presuming they're going to take your recommendation, but be comfortable backing up if you need to and just delving into the particulars of what their worries are and try to be honest about the real but minimal risks that we have uh, of vaccines and, and don't give up. It's super important not to give up. And, you know, one of the things that I'm working on right now is it feels like that vaccine hesitancy is a huge issue. And it is, it's a huge issue, but we probably vac we miss vaccination opportunities more because of lack of efficiencies in our office. I listened to your uh, podcast with Phil Boucher. <laughs> The he's efficiency like, maven. Yeah, he's amazing. He's, he's the efficiency god. I, I love him. And that is like my, if I wasn't a doctor, I'd want to be an efficiency expert. It's, it's, it's my favorite thing. And so, I mean, there's so many places where we can engage our, our medical staff, our MAs, our nurses, our computers, you know, our, we have Epic. I'm trying to figure out how can we maximize Epic's communication ability to remind people about vaccines because people don't get vaccinated for a lot of reasons, some of which is hesitancy, but much of which is they forgot. They didn't know they needed the vaccine because we forgot to tell them, you know, they didn't come in for two years for their visit. And yeah, so those are all systems problems. Yeah. There's so much that we miss for that reason, or those reasons that we can also work on. And it doesn't, it can feel like vaccination is all up to us as the medical provider, but there's so many ways that our staff and our systems can support us that I think we need to look at those as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for talking today. Where can people yeah, find your you. book? Let's Talk Vaccines, A Clinician's Guide to Addressing Vaccine Hesitancy and Saving Lives. Well, thank you for that little plug. Um, <laughs> uh, they can find it in a variety of places. Amazon is probably the biggest one, Barnes & Noble, um, the Walters Kluwer, uh, Lippincott William. Wilson, lww.com. I can't remember what it stands for. lww.com is another place. That's the publisher site. So it's available. And then I also have my website, which is uh, www.gretchenlassalmd.com, where I try to post, I do blog posts about every two to three weeks, depending on life. Like you said, <laughs> what's up with the kids that, that week? I try to get blog posts out and, and have it be a resource for reliable vaccine research and videos. And there's a list of some really excellent resources and books. And the some of the resources I gave you, like the Voices for Vaccines and Children's Hospital Philadelphia, there's a long list of excellent websites and things that people can go to to get really reliable information. Wonderful. And it's definitely going to change the way I am able to address those patients. And I'm sure for all our listeners and all the readers of your book. So, so thank you again for doing this. Thank you so much. It was fun. <laughs> That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.